We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, today I'm tasked with talking to you about the microbiome and infections of the reproductive tract in human females. I will note that my academic home has been at Washington University for the past uh, 10 plus years, but in a matter of weeks, I'll be moving to the University of California, San Diego. Very excited about that. Okay, so by now we're all well aware that the human microbiome um, is important and has key roles in human physiology. And um, this is, while understudied, very important in the female reproductive tract of humans as well. In fact, in the human reproductive tract, uh, microbes have a very strong influence um, on reproductive success. And as you'll see, um, this could have potential for uh, selective uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, in the human population. So to give you a broad overview of the human vaginal microbiota, um, you could sort of think of the um, vaginal microbiota as falling into one of two very large groups. So one of those is lactobacillus dominant microbiome. Um, typically, these are dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus or Lactobacillus inners. Um, you'll see here an example uh, from a single individual of a Lactobacillus crispatus dominant microbiome. And then in contrast, uh, some women have a much more diverse microbiome that rather than being occupied mainly by a single species, has quite a large number of, of species associated with it. Now, one interesting feature of these diverse microbiomes is that they are also um, often have the feature of having 10 to 100 fold more abundant bacteria present uh, within this niche. So one of the things I'll call out to you now, because it'll become more important later, is that Gardnerella vaginalis um, is often a major component of this diverse microbiome. Now, um, these diverse microbiomes are often called um, bacterial vaginosis, and we'll be talking about that term quite a bit more. Um, anywhere from 23 to 29% of women worldwide uh, have this condition, BV, um, and it's been associated with a number of poor reproductive health outcomes, which we will also discuss. Before we get there, I'd like to introduce you to some of the clinical features of bacterial vaginosis. So back in the 1950s, this guy named Gardner um, and, and colleagues uh, had worked up some of the features of what would become known as bacterial vaginosis. So they found that, that women with BV had um, high numbers of exfoliated epithelial cells coated with bacteria, which they called clue cells. This is shown here. You can see a normal epithelial cell and then one that is um, just covered in bacteria. They also found that women with this condition had abnormally thin mucus secretions, a sharp amine odor upon potassium hydroxide treatment, and a higher than normal pH. Now, one of the things that Gardner also found um, and that was reconfirmed upon a lot of the molecular techniques that were used later, which I have already showed you data about, um, was that 
these women also had overgrowth of coccobacilli, um, and this turned out to be Gardnerella vaginalis, as I've already shown you. So another way to, to look at the microbiome is um, by doing a gram stain um, and looking under the microscope. So what you'll see uh, with women that have a lactobacillus dominant microbiome shown here is that you'll see a lot of long gram positive um, rods uh, that are characteristic of lactobacilli. Whereas in the context of bacterial vaginosis, you instead see um, many diverse morphotypes, not a lot of these long gram positive rods, um, but, but probably a lot higher number of bacteria here as well. So why do we even really care about this? Is this just another pattern of the microbiome? Um, this is potentially you know, important um, both to anthropogeny potentially, but um, especially to, to women's health here and now. So women with bacterial vaginosis have an increased likelihood of sexually transmitted infections of all kinds, bacterial, viral, and parasitic. They have a higher likelihood of being infertile, of having urinary tract infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, and a whole host of other things, including uh, being vaginally colonized by pathogens, experiencing um, uh, ascending infections up into the intrauterine space of the placenta and amniotic fluid, um, as shown here in the picture, and also of experiencing things like premature rupture of membranes and preterm labor, um, and ultimately um, having a baby that is admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. So any one of these factors could be uh, drivers of selection. And just to further emphasize that, uh, preterm birth is now the leading cause of death in children under five. Um, and as you can see here, um, and it's believed that about 40% of preterm births are caused by infection. So people have also compared um, the microbiome in women who have delivered preterm versus those who have delivered full term and found that um, high levels of lactobacilli are often found to be protective um, in term deliveries, whereas um, they're found at lower levels in preterm deliveries, whereas Gardnerella is sort of the opposite finding um, where you see that at lower levels in term deliveries and higher levels in preterm deliveries. So now I want to give you a, a little bit of interesting um, context from recent human history, um, considering vaginal care products. So going back to the 1950s, um, we have individuals like um, Dr. Gardner, who uh, were telling women vaginal douching is unnecessary. Um, but around the same time, um, there was a, you know, a, a very widespread advertising campaign by Lysol um, in which they were trying to convince women that they should use Lysol as a vaginal douche product for their complete feminine hygiene. Now, this is quite disturbing um, and becomes more so um, when they start talking about um, Lysol protecting your daintiness. Um, now I'll let you all be appalled by your own Google searches on this. Um, I'll give you one further example of a quote from one of these ads that a young wife should beware of this grave womanly offense. And um, by grave womanly offense, they mean not sanitizing your vagina with Lysol. So Today, one would like to think that um, we're in a different place. We still have sexual health practitioners that are telling us you don't need to douche. And you know, one of the things I've heard over and over again is the vagina is like a self-cleaning oven. You don't need to clean it out up there. Um, however, if you look at any, in any grocery store or pharmacy, there's an entire section that's devoted to these products. And so, you know, the question is, um, what message are we sending? So how did we get here? Um, and you might be asking yourself, what does this have to do with anthropogeny? So um, in the next few slides, um, I'm going to tell you more about the human vaginal microbiome and the, and the niche, which is uniquely acidic. I'll tell you about um, the BV-like microbiome and try to make an argument that it might actually be the ancestral state. Um, and then begin a discussion of how this might relate to human origins and evolution. 
Um, and, you know, one of the prevailing ideas is that, you know, the good bacteria, the lactobacilli are protective. Uh, but one of the one of the other things that I would like to introduce is that, um, you know, there's this flip side of the coin where bad bacteria may predispose to disease, particularly if those bad bacteria are human specific, um, that might be of interest um, to anthropogeny. So going back to this uh, lactobacillus dominant microbiome, um, it's important to note that lactobacilli are lactic acid bacteria. Um, and you know one of the features that happens when you have a, an abundance of these lactobacilli present is that they're able to um, acidify the environment. So you see on the right side of the screen here that um, you know, these, these organisms produce a lot of lactate and those very high levels of lactate um, end up with a, a very characteristic acidic pH in the human vagina. So now I'm showing you um, some data that has been published in the literature where, you know, they're taking um, vaginal pH measured in many different studies and, and plotting it all on the same graph here. And so one of the things you can immediately see is that in the context of a, a, a you know, normal, healthy woman um, without BV, that you have a, a very low acidic pH, lower than any of the other measurements on this graph. Um, and you know, what you'll also see is that if you look at the human with BV, there's a higher vaginal pH, and this is consistent with some of the other diagnostic information that I've given you. Um, but immediately below that, you see that at least in one study of a human chimpanzee and of all of baboons, that um, there are, there's somewhat lower um, pH than any of the other mammals. And this is tracking um, more closely with what you see in, um, in the context of bacterial vaginosis. So this is a first suggestion that the vaginal microbiome in humans and its acidic pH um, may not be completely unique to humans. However, I think we have to take um, some of this a little bit with a grain of salt. Um, the vaginal microenvironment um, and the microbiota can fluctuate quite a bit. And this is another set of studies plotted on the same graph um, where they're essentially looking at how the pH changes with fluctuating estrogen levels. And in virtually every context that you see on this graph, when there's high levels of estrogen, um, it tends to support bacteria that produce um, acids and result in a lower vaginal pH. So you can see here that um, even the P here, which is for possum, you know, even though it's you know obviously not even a, a primate, it's still kind of falling into this um, five to six pH range. Um, which is similar to, to the context of BV as well. So it may just be that you know, fluctuating estrogen levels um, and there may not be quite enough individuals um, studied to, to really fully understand this. But regardless, what you can take away from this graph, um, looking down below here, is that you know, humans um, have this you know, characteristically low vaginal pH, which appears to be lower than all of these other animals that have been studied. So, Moving now into the idea that the diverse BV-like microbiome may actually be the ancestral state, I wanted to show you some data. This is from uh, the northern pigtail macaque, but there's um, similar data that's been presented um, from a number of other non-human primates. And what you can see here is that this is a diverse microbiome. And this is also true of the other non-human primates that have been studied. There are a number of taxonomic groups that you're seeing here um, that have also been described in the context of bacterial vaginosis, in including Atopobium and Snethia, Prevotella, and a number of other organisms here. Now, there are some limitations um, to the data that have been presented in the field. Uh, the numbers of individuals are rather low. There's not a lot of studies that have compared captive versus wild animals, and the hormonal status of these individuals is often unknown. Now, one thing that I do want to note is that um, in my review of the literature, I've not found any studies that have been described where Gardnerella is a part of the uh, non-human primate vaginal microbiome. So that could be significant. Um, so some, some things have been put forward in terms of making evolutionary sense of the human vaginal microbiota. 
non-human mammals um, don't have dominant lactobacilli, um, which therefore couldn't be an absolute requirement for a healthy vagina. Another point is that the, the BV microbiome has taxonomic parallels with, with other primate vaginal microbiomes, as we just discussed, and may be the ancestral state. Um, and finally, uh, selection for lactobacillus dominance uh, could have come about due to the relative protection uh, afforded from sexually transmitted and intrauterine infections um, and their um, subsequent effects on reproductive success. So coming back to this idea of whether Gardnerella contributes to adverse reproductive outcomes in humans, um, most women, in fact, harbor Gardnerella at some level, um, but as I've shown you, it's often the most abundant species in women with BV. It actually comprises a very diverse set of organisms that haven't been that well studied yet. Um, in my lab, we've shown that Gardnerella vaginalis can cause features of BV in a mouse model. And in fact, when we do co-infections uh, with other organisms, we find that Gardnerella vaginalis can encourage the pathogenesis of other organisms. So I'll just give you one brief example of that. In a mouse model of pregnancy, um, we found that Gardnerella vaginalis can encourage uterine infection by another human pathogen, group B streptococcus. Um, now here, what you're looking at um, is the, the number of, of pregnant females um, where where you actually see evidence of live bacteria coming out of uterine or placental tissues. Um, when GBS is delivered in high numbers, um, all of the animals that were studied um, got infected uh, in the upper reproductive tract. Um, when GBS was introduced at lower numbers, um, there were no infections um, of, the, of the uterine or placental tissue. However, under this condition of, of lower group B strep inoculum to the vagina, um, when it's delivered in the context of Gardnerella vaginalis, you again see that about half of the animals develop um, uterine and placental infections. So, um, you know, it may be that, uh, that Gardnerella vaginalis um, being present within the vaginal microbiome of humans may be um, helping to encourage other pathogens to be more pathogenic. So going from there, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a, a particular virulence factor of Gardnerella vaginalis, um, an enzyme called sialidase. Now, so Gardnerella here produces uh, sialidase, which we're showing as scissors here. Um, and you can see in the graph on the right that women with bacterial vaginosis have um, you know, high levels of vaginal sialidase activity, whereas women without BV do not. Um, it's believed that Gardnerella is the primary contributor of this enzyme um, to the vaginal fluids, and it can not only cleave off the sialic acids, but then um, use them and catabolize them and grow um, by being able to use them. And then this allows for a depletion of the sialic acids from the mucosal surface. So we think sialidase is important because it's been independently associated with reduced mucus viscosity and increased risk of preterm birth, placental infections, um, as well as recurrent BV. It also liberates sialic acids that can be used by, by other organisms that don't have their own sialidases. So you might be asking yourself, what are sialic acids anyway? Um, so sialic acids are carbohydrate residues that are rich in mucosal secretions, but also on cell surfaces. Um, they're shown in, in these little red diamonds here. And so sialidase um, may be important both for its ability to cleave sialic acids from you know, these secreted molecules, um, but also from cell surfaces. So we've done some biochemical experiments where we can show that um, you know, a preparation of mucin, um, shown here, is highly um, viscous compared to water, which is expected. Uh, when you treat that with sialidase, um, treating with sialidase is sufficient to substantially reduce the viscosity, um, whereas you can get some of that back by introducing a sialidase inhibitor. Now, we think this could be important because secreted glycans and mucins are an important component of the mucus plug, which blocks the opening to the uterus uh, during pregnancy. And so if bacteria are able to degrade this, um, it may decrease the viscosity of that barrier and allow for ascending infection. We've also been able to show that in addition to these secreted um, molecules being degraded, that sialic acids are also degraded from the epithelial surfaces. Um, and so here um, you're seeing MAL2, which is a sialic acid binding lectin, 
um, you know, brightly stains the cell surfaces of uh, epithelial cells from women um, that do not have BV, but then from women with bacterial vaginosis, um, you don't see that green staining. Whereas uh, a, another lectin that recognizes terminal galactose residues um, is not evident, um, does not have evident staining in women without BV, but has bright staining in women with BV. Um, so the, the epithelial surface um, and the glycans um, that, are, that are there are you know, inherently different in these two different contexts. And we've also been able to show this biochemically, that the glycans present on the cell surfaces are, you know, that there's a depletion of the sialic acids present on both um, N-type glycans as well as O-type glycans. So I'm going to wrap up here um, by just trying to introduce the concept that it's not just um, sialidases that may be important, but that sialic acids are important in a whole variety of different host microbe interactions. So, you know, there are a number of organisms that, you know, can forage and degrade um, sialoglycans and use those um, molecules for energy. Um, there are others that bind to sialic acids or to other carbohydrate residues that may be underneath. Um, and then there are organisms that, that mimic um, sialic acids as well. And so, you know, when, when we're thinking about the ability of, you know, these sialidases in the context of bacterial vaginosis to degrade sialic acid molecules and deplete them from the mucosal surface, it begins to reveal all these different sorts of ideas about um, how sialic acid biology may change in this setting and how that may affect um, the physiology in humans. And as a final note on that, this is not my current area of study, but given that a number of other individuals at UCSD work on these sialic acid binding lectins called SIGLEX, um, I think it's going to be an important um, area of, of collaboration that may allow us to find new things about human evolution. Um, so it's already been shown that um, SIGLEX are, are rapidly evolving in the human lineage. Um, these molecules, these receptors bind to sialic acids and, and can signal within cells. And so when, again, thinking about the presence of sialidases within the cervical vaginal niche, um, what happens to the signaling of these SIGLEX when the sialic acids are depleted from those cell surfaces? Um, there are quite a lot of implications here, but um, we don't have uh, very much research yet, so um, that'll be a future direction. And so with that, I'll acknowledge um, individuals in my lab that have contributed to the data that I've shown you today, um, and, and also the Center for Women's Infectious Disease Research and the Center for uh, Reproductive Health Sciences at Washington University. Um, and with that, I will be happy to take your questions in the, um, the live stream question-answer period. Thank you.